tales for dark nights. I can see my house from here, atop this small cliff at the edge of the woods. I suppose he could see his, too, once. But it's my time now. My time to look upon things taken from me. My turn to take root in what has become my new home. My father and I came here from Sussex in the spring of 1742. We were poor, barely getting by and not far from a life of poverty in the streets. Truth be told, we fared no better than that. Father was out of work, and we lived in a small hut that barely kept out the wind and snow. We went days at a time without food and sickness. Came easy. Mother, she... Well, she didn't make it. Father and I barely scraped by that winter, and with nothing to show for it but a long, pitiless bout of mourning. I was only five at the time, helpless, and Father swore he would never lose me the way he lost Mother. Needless to say, it was a tough decision, but he supposed we'd find a better life in the colonies, even if the only way to see us across the Atlantic was in a red coat with a musket in hand. So, after a number of months at sea, we found ourselves in a small fort south of Boston, my father serving His Majesty in the New World. We were sent here directly, with little to no welcome or induction. They said father would find everything he needed here on arrival, from training and briefing to housing accommodations. They said they needed all the help they could get, no time for formalities. Their sense of urgency made Father nervous, but we never really had a chance to protest or reconsider, especially since we had already come so far. We were escorted to our new home within a week. Fort Whalen, they called it, a fringe installment with no real strategic value. Apparently, the place served another purpose. At first... Some spoke of it with sarcasm and dissent, annoyed to have been stationed there for such a ludicrous reason. They regarded it as nothing more than their commanding officer's paranoid response to an old ghost story, though some say they saw it with their own eyes. In any case, that fort was not meant to guard against any man. It was meant to keep something more sinister at bay. We had hardly settled in before we started seeing something, too, whatever it was. They sounded like children about the same size I was, except they made no sound but for the rustling of leaves under their feet, or at least what I assumed were feet. I never really saw them clearly, either, just fleeting glances before they scurried back into the brush or the treetops. They weren't human, that much was certain. They terrified every man within those fort walls, armed or otherwise, especially when they learned that weapons fire was useless. Every shot missed its mark. After all, one cannot hit what one can hardly see. When we arrived, hunting parties still regularly ventured deep into the woods in an attempt to rid us of whatever haunted them. Though the terror destroyed morale, and a few men even deserted. Rather, that's what we had hoped. They were never seen or heard from it, and nobody liked to entertain the idea of the alternative. Yet, for all of the constant fear and worry, there was only ever a single obvious victim, only one person for whom we could reasonably assume an unpleasant end. In spite of all of his massed forces and paranoia, it was the captain, they claimed. The men said they found his quarters empty one day, ransacked, and the floor covered with fallen leaves and twigs, just as the other unfortunates he had vanished without a trace. Strangely, everything fell quiet after that. 
No more sounds of children pattering about the woods. No more sightings. No more terror. It seemed that they had claimed what they were after. They had no interest in the rest of us. Before long, the whole ordeal faded to an unpleasant memory, and a sense of normality finally settled in. By then, Father had already watched over those woods for the better part of twelve years. His service earned us enough money for a new life in this land, and we took the opportunity as soon as it presented itself. Father resigned from military service, choosing a civilian life to raise me and open a general store. When the military pulled out and stationed elsewhere, the fort itself served nicely for the foundations of a trading post. And that is where we stayed for the remainder of my childhood. When he finally scraped together enough money, Father left to open a store in South Boston. It was a dream he had spoken of from the moment we arrived on these shores. I had helped run his business over the years, so he invited me to move with him to settle down and start a family business. Still, he left the decision up to me. I was seventeen, and he considered me a man. Looking back now, I wish I had. Instead, I chose to stay behind, struck my own path through life. I had made friends with some other boys during my time there, hunting rabbits in the woods after the danger had passed. It was something I loved, and several of us decided to make a living hunting and trapping, selling our wares, at the trade post in my father's old store. For the following five years, life had been good to me. The forest had blessed me with abundant bounty and a respectable living, as well as the attention of a young girl I might have married one day. I had built a happy life for myself, and I thought I had come to know every corner of those woods. But then they returned, and they showed me a place I never knew existed, a place with which I've since become all too familiar. They arrived slowly at first, a few rustling sounds on hunts that I took for foxes or squirrels in the underbrush. Then the sounds grew in number, more frequent, more hectic, and they followed me. They were no animals I knew, these things that so boldly approached without fear of man. On one of my longer outings, they haunted my camp. I began to see them in the shadows, just beyond the firelight, clearer than I ever had before. Mischievous little imps, bodies like knots of wood and vines, tufts of grass and flowering plants, atop bobbling lumps with the vague semblance of heads. They danced like elated children in and out of the light, and they made sounds I'd never heard from them before. Scratchy, wet, clicking noises like ghostly giggles from broken throats. This behavior was new. Where they had once hidden from me, they now clearly sought my attention. In fact, they seemed to beckon. Truly, I sensed no hostility from them, and from the depths of the woods came something else new. A sweet scent hanging on the breeze, warm and welcoming in the same manner as freshly baked bread. Perhaps more so. I'd not have thought to call it merely pleasant. No, it was more... compelling. That scent, that bewitching aroma, came from them. It was a portent of their coming, and it grew stronger with their every visit. It was like nothing I had ever smelled, terribly powerful, and it stirred something in me. I know now that they used it to lure me, and I'm sad to say that it was to great effect. Totally unaware of myself, I began to track my quarry on a very specific path, a narrow and invisible road marked by that damnable odor. When it would fade off, I would sink into melancholy and fatigue, dissatisfied with the typically brisk and invigorating air of the wild. I would make camp, 
when it left me, sometimes early to ease my growing weariness, there I would remain until the scent returned. And it always did. Those woods nearly chewed me to the bone before I found my way through, and the imps of leaf and root led me faithfully to my fate. I crawled my way through a gauntlet of dense thorn brushes from dawn till dusk, and they left my clothing in tatters that barely clung to my form. I was an utter mess, caked from head to toe in the drying filth of the untamed acres I left behind. I had no provisions left and little energy left for travel. One can imagine my relief when I finally emerged into a clearing, and in that clearing awaited a small, crude, precariously constructed cabin. I was astonished, to say the least. It was deeper in the woods than I had ever bothered to explore, deeper than my trade would ever take me, and much too far for any sign of civilization to be worth the trip. For whatever reason, the latter half of my journey provided little to no game to sustain me, let alone to make a living. Worse yet, I could find no source of clean water within reasonable distance. Who would build a home here? And how could they possibly hope to survive? Of course, I was not in the proper state of mind to give these questions the consideration they warranted. Near death, and with no way to survive the trek home, even if the imps would grant me control of my senses to do so, I could only rejoice at the chance of rescue. So I approached the cabin, hoping beyond hope for a hot meal, a cool drink, and a warm bed for the night. It was only in those first few steps into the clearing that I escaped the bewitching scent trail for the first time in what must have been months. I left home in the middle of summer that year, and I arrived at the cabin to find leaves crunching beneath my boots. And with that sound came another realization. It was the only sound I could hear. In fact, it was the only sound I had heard in quite some time. For days proceeding, as far as I could tell, I had been the only source of movement or life in those woods. I hadn't heard so much as a single bird chirping in the canopy. I had been too entranced by the scent to notice, but no life resided there other than the trees, myself, and whoever occupied the mysterious cabin that stood before me. The thought unnerved me, though not enough to sway me from seizing the chance. Slowly, cautiously, I approached the door. Each step through the crunching forest floor betrayed my presence, rendering any attempt at stealth effectively useless. Something about the place seemed so ominous, so damning. Part of me felt the urge to flee, but another part felt welcome. Little did I know just how welcome I really was, but I would soon learn. As my loud approach sounded in the otherwise total silence, nothing answered my intrusion, yet somehow I still knew I was not alone. I couldn't see it, I couldn't hear it, but something or someone was watching. It had been watching my entire journey through this territory, watching with eager intent. It summoned me here and for a reason. Nobody answered my knocks, so I slowly opened the door about the width of my wrist and peered inside. There, at the far end of the nearly empty room, I found a rather disturbing surprise. An old, thin man curled up on a bed made of leaves and grass, and I recognized his face. Captain Harrison, who no one had seen since we found his office abandoned all those years ago. He had apparently been living here in seclusion. I'm unsure just how long I stood there staring at him. I had not seen the man since I was a small child. I'd given him up for dead like everyone else. Yet, here he was, alive and looking like he had seen the worst of every 
years since his disappearance. He'd wasted away to nearly nothing, now little more than a rickety skeleton, and thinning skin pocked over with liver spots. He'd bald significantly, and what little hair skirted that shiny hemisphere had grown long and matted with filth. The only familiar part of him was his uniform, although it had changed just as much. It had grown dirtier than I had ever imagined any garment could, and rendered nearly to shreds. Captain Harrison? I hesitantly called. He started, as did I. He seemed ill, laying with such stillness that I thought he'd taken to his deathbed. The sudden movement was jarring, but I couldn't blame him. It must have been the first word he'd heard spoken by another in years. "'Who's there?' he croaked, thinning his eyes against the fresh light shining through the gloom. At first I was speechless. I could not bring myself to reply. "'Who's there? Who calls me by that name?' he hoarsely demanded. "'I, I, I knew you,' I stammered. "'My father... He served under you, Fort Wayland. Do you remember? He stood on weak legs and hobbled toward me as quickly as they would carry him. I recoiled a bit when he thrust his face uncomfortably close to my own. He gazed at me with bewilderment as if through a dense fog. Wayland, you, the young ones, he muttered and his fall breath stung my eyes. He paused at length, then looked away. No. Another time. Another light. I have no name now. I am. I care for them. They need me. He trailed up, meandering back to his bed of grass. He lay down and faced the wall, dismissing my presence. I raised my voice, shouted, poked, and prodded, but to no avail. It didn't seem that he was ignoring me so much as, in his mind, I simply ceased to exist. I could hear him muttering in his fitful sleep something about elder trees and saplings and how he wished to join them. Clearly, he had gone quite mad. Though if he had indeed been tormented by the same entities that led me to him, if he suffered that bewitching odor and the dancing of the imps for all those years, his state of mind made perfect sense. I could not imagine what he must have been through. Begrudgingly, I gave up trying to rouse him. He would answer my questions in the morning. Until then... I was content to rest on the other side of the room. Honestly, I should have never closed my eyes in such a dreadful place, much less while sharing it with a madman. However, I had no strength to brave those woods any farther. I doubt the imps would have let me wander far anyway. I had little choice. My sleep was restless that night, even painful. Torrential dreams of howling voices calling to me. Clouds of dust rose and swirled about me, obscuring my vision. It grew thicker, settling atop my tongue, in my nostrils and ears and over my eyes. It solidified around me like a crystallizing tomb, and I soon found myself held tightly within the crushing fist of the earth. The weight of ages grew tighter against my body constricting me until it squeezed the last breath of air from my lungs. I should have died then, but I somehow remained awake and alert enough to sense the minute rumbling of something weaving through the soil. Roots worked their way around my arms and legs, ensnaring them as my eyes darted in panic behind closed lids. There was no escape. They wound about my torso and they pierced my chest with surprising sharpness. Through the burning agony, I could feel the narrow ends blanketing and squeezing my heart. The pain grew ever more intense. 
throbbing through my arteries and veins, just as my limbs fell numb. I heard a faint voice. We're a new one, my lords, it said. He is young and strong, this one, a man of the forest. He will serve you well. And all fell silent. Waking was bittersweet. I gulped deep lungfuls of air in shock. Breathing so quickly made my head spin and my heart pound, but I didn't care. Each sweet breath warned me to never take life for granted again, and I wouldn't. I stretched my limbs and flexed my digits, and I sighed as I felt the blood flow through them once more. Thank God it was only a nightmare. It was a horror I hoped never to experience again. Yet, despite my relief, I awoke in terrible discomfort. I had gone to sleep hungry, thirsty, and exhausted, and it had grown far worse in the night. My skin had lost its pallor, and I felt lightheaded. My vision had turned hazy. My mouth felt like a sweltering desert, and I was starving. I had never felt so ill in all my life. Most disturbing of all, a curious rash had spread across my chest, violently red and swollen, and it burned like fire. It originated from the point where the dream roots had pierced my flesh. The agony I suffered that night, whatever had caused it, in waking reality, had been real. Had I been in a more stable state of mind, I might have suspected ill intent from the deranged Harrison but I could think only of my parched throat and the gnawing hunger pains. I could hardly move, and Harrison was nowhere to be found. So I crawled desperately for the door, slowed by my sudden weakness, but I could not stop. The pangs of hunger were relentless. I would have eaten the dead leaves of the forest floor to ease the pain if I had to, and I nearly did just that. I was already holding a crumbling mass to my open mouth before I saw something far more appetizing in the distance. I saw Harrison, just past the trees in another tiny clearing, tending to a small vegetable garden. Behind him sat a basket of crudely woven tree bark containing what appeared to be large, distorted turnips. They looked edible, that was the only thing that interested me. I rose and scrambled for the clearing faster than I would have thought my ailments would permit. Desperation is our greatest motivator, it seems. All I could see was food, and my aching body would not stand between me and those peculiar vegetables. I tumbled and clumsily overturned the basket, spilling its contents to the muddy patch of their growth. Still, I heard no protest from Harrison, if he was even yet aware of my presence. He seemed much too busy doting over those roots still buried to care. The strange vegetable pulsed in my hands like a feverish heart, and it felt warm, alive in a way no plant should be. But its alien nature did not sway me. I didn't even bother to brush away the mud, I just bit in through the filth, and it released sweet fluid that quenched my burning throat. The husk, rich and succulent, tasted of cooked flesh and the purest goodness of earth. It washed my pain away, made me whole again, and it would sustain me for a time. The sudden relief was overwhelming. It calmed my mind and relaxed my body, and I fell into a more peaceful slumber, though not before catching a blurry glimpse of Harrison's face gazing down at me. He wore a satisfied grin. I awoke in the cabinet, with the last light of dusk spilling through the half-open door. I'd been out for most of the day, and Harrison had apparently carried me, How he even managed to budge me with his waning muscles, I'll never know. In hindsight, I suppose it might not have been him at all, but some other unseen hand. He sat across from me, 
watching me as he bit into one of the roots that had saved my life. He wore the same grin all the while, munching the life-giving vegetable with yellowing teeth, some broken or missing. He stared into my eyes at length, and he chuckled through a mouthful of the strange turnip. What's so funny, I asked, finally able to speak. He chuckled again, and he stared at the rash on my exposed chest. It had turned leathery and thick like a nasty scar. I touched it, and I can swear that it moved beneath my fingertips, however slightly. I recoiled in horror, and his chuckle turned into a full belly laugh, juice dribbling down his chin. I was confused and infuriated. What in the bloody hell is this? I demanded. What's happening to me? What have you done? The seed, he murmured. I narrowed my eyes at him, dissatisfied with his answer. He continued, speaking louder this time. They planted their seed. Planted it there. He pointed to the leathery scar with one bony finger. I clutched my chest with a looming sense of dread. What have you done to me, old man? I demanded once more, moving to strike him, but I froze as he stood. He gave no reply. Only removed the thin garment covering his torso. Unveiling a horror I shudder to remember, even now. Especially in knowing that one day my fate will be the same. His body, withered as it had become, was covered in the same leathery scars. They wrapped about his distended belly and over his ribs like a menacing talon, much darker than my own, swollen and visibly undulating with parasitic light. Some scars had hardened like bark, some with small fleshy branches, and some hosted flaps of softy skin, not unlike leaves riddled with inflamed and burst veins, reddened with his lifeblood. Here, you see, he laughed in madness. This is the gift I give to you. The sight was too much to bear. My gorge rose and I nearly vomited, but he shouted at me furiously. No, you mustn't waste the feeding root. They gave it to you. You will be grateful. I swallowed hard. A cold sweat glazed my skin as I beheld his grotesque form. What? What are you? I stammered. A menacing smile crept across his lips. I am ascended, boy. Evolved. I eat of the root every day that they might grow. I tended to my masters in their need, keep them safe and hardy. I give them my flesh, and soon, soon I will join them. I will become one of their elder trees. This is my reward. I gasped a series of deep, panicked breaths. You call this a reward? I tried to calm myself and gather my thoughts. What is this place? What are they? Why are they bring me here? They need you. Need me for what? Why me? They will tell you. You will hear them soon. I grew tired of his cryptic nonsense. Well, I want no part of it. I just want to go home. Don't you see? He gestured to our surroundings, the forest clearing, and the cabin. This is your home. A new home. You've been chosen. I wouldn't hear another word of it. I gathered all of my strength and ran for the door, threw it open in a rage, and sprinted blindly into the woods. You've nowhere to run, he called after me. They'll not let you leave. I ignored his warning. Nothing could keep me there. Not if I could help it. 
Nettles and twigs stung my bare feet with every step. Bare bushes left me covered in cuts and scrapes. I had no idea where I was going, but I didn't care. I only wished to put as much distance between me and that horrible place as possible. I would not be their prisoner. I ran through the night, even through total darkness. It wasn't until I tripped for the third time and sprained my ankle that I finally stopped. I fully expected the imps, or something more terrifying, to pounce on me and drag me back to the clearing. They didn't. They didn't need to, I soon learned. As I stubbornly crawled even further into the forest, just as Harrison said, the voices finally caught up to me. Or perhaps it would be inaccurate to call them voices. They used no words, only expressed the force of their will with demanding aches in my head. They needn't have spoken, for I understood them all the same. They were the trees, the oldest and wisest of them. The elders. They called for my return, and their fury stirred the scar upon my chest. I could feel it writhing, much stronger than before, and it made a noise, a diminutive whine. I could feel it tightening around my heart in anger. I rolled about in agony, clutched my chest, and begged it to stop. It wanted to eat me again, to feed it, and its hunger was ravenous. Just when I thought it would kill me, it loosened its grip and allowed me to move, but the voices never ceased. I had no idea what I could do. I desperately brushed my hands through the leaves and dirt in the dark. Surely there had to be something I could eat, something to quiet the stirring of the parasite. At last I found a small scattering of berries. They might have been poisonous, but I took my chances. I filled my mouth to capacity as fast as I could, and my jaw ached as I chewed and swallowed too quickly. I sighed with relief, certain that I quelled the hunger of the seed in my chest. However, only moments after I swallowed, the juices and pulp came spewing forth from my throat and onto the dry leaves. The berries hadn't even reached my stomach before they were ejected, and the voices in my head sounded once more. The root, they said, and the parasite gave one more nourishing, breath-stealing squeeze. The parasite would only accept the root that sated it before, and that's when I understood. This thing in my chest, this seed, was no gift at all. It was a leash. I had never seen that strange vegetable before my time in the clearing, and I suspected I would find it nowhere else. Doubtless they grew only at the feet of the elder trees. I would have died that night had I not stumbled upon a small stream, the first I had ever come across since I left my home months before. Perhaps I thought it was the water source that fed the root patch, and I could safely assume that my captors agreed as the pain in my chest and the voices in my head began to subside as I followed it to the south. I followed its winding trail until morning, and it led me faithfully to the patch, where I gorged myself on my only available relief. Through mouthfuls and short breaths, I looked around in sorrow at my prison, defeated. The seed was within me now, and I could survive nowhere else. Of course, Harrison knew this all too well, so it was no surprise to find him waiting for me. You cannot leave, boy, he gravely declared as he trudged toward me through the mud. Your old life is over. You serve us now. I could give no reply. I knew he was right, and I despaired. Just as I finished off the route, the voices called again. Louder this time, and Harrison heard them, too. 
The largest of the trees groaned, and they seemed to lean inward toward him, almost as if bowing in respect. "'It is time!' he exclaimed. "'At last! Oh, how I've waited for this day! Thank you, my lords!' I watched as great roots rose from the soil and wrapped about his legs, climbed his body, and pierced between his ribs. His pain was obvious, and yet he laughed through the blood pooling in his mouth, giving thanks until his last breath. Before long, he fell still and silent. His glassy eyes focused on mine as the last of the roots sealed him in a wooden cocoon and dragged him beneath the soil. It was the strangest, most frightening thing I had ever witnessed. Soon he was gone forever, and I was left alone to contemplate my fate. That night, as I rested on the newly vacant bed of grass, I heard from him one last time, speaking with a wordless force of will, the same as the elder trees. These were his parting words to me. Service. Care for us as I cared for them before you. Here you will have all you will need. Serve us well and in death. Live forever among us. That was twenty-five years ago, and I have lived here alone ever since. I keep the elders healthy, I tend the saplings and the feeding roots, and I sate the seed in my chest to live. I am the tree keeper, just as many before me, and one day some unwitting child will take my place. Over time, the trees will take back the forest. They will take the dwellings of man, and we can only hope they will spare us, if only to serve them. Until then, I will give them my flesh and labor, and to feed the seed that will preserve my soul in ancient wood. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights 